The popularity of electric scooters has skyrocketed over the past few years, and as more and more people purchase an electric scooter for themselves, manufacturers must look for ways to improve their product to compete with rapidly growing competition. Ignoring for a moment the plethora of manufacturing defects that currently plague modern electric scooters, I want to look at the top five changes or upgrades that I want to see to overall design and build of electric scooters moving forward, and why I think these changes will be beneficial to the consumer. These are ordered in the way that flows best for the video, rather than least to most wanted changes. All these changes are basically equally important in my eyes, and are in their own way necessary to make the best scooter possible. Let's start with number 5, wheel size. Electric scooter manufacturers seem to have adopted the proportions and base design of kick scooters that we all had and loved as kids. The result of this means that electric scooters all seem to have tiny, disproportionate wheels. Tiny wheels are fine for kick scooters that are made for riding on smooth surfaces like skate parks and sidewalks, but the demands of the average consumer are a little bit more than that. It is interesting to see that 10 inch diameter wheels are the largest size that is standard in the industry, while some electric scooters have wheels as small as 8 inches. This seems to be simply either a complete misunderstanding of how these scooters are getting used and who is using them, or a case where no manufacturer has bothered to innovate and make their own decisions when it comes to wheel size. In any case, 8 or 8.5 inches is far too small of a size to be used on scooters, especially electric scooters, of any power or size, let alone scooters like the 08X which are capable of speeds of over 30 miles an hour. Traveling these speeds on such small wheels is dangerous and uncomfortable. My two fastest scooters, the Cabo Mantis and the Varla Eagle 1, which both hit speeds of over 40 miles an hour, sport 10 inch wheels. From the very first time I rode my Cabo Mantis, I was surprised how small the wheels felt under the weight of the scooter, especially at higher speeds. This thought was reinforced when I first rode the Eagle 1, which is higher off the ground and heavier. Frankly, 10 inch wheels on a scooter of this weight and size is almost comical and is quite unsafe. Smaller wheels increase the chance of speed wobble, something that happens more often than I would like when riding these faster scooters and makes taking bumps and potholes quite sketchy even with the bigger suspension of say the Eagle 1. Larger wheels, a minimum of 11 inches, I believe are 100% necessary on scooters in this tier and I would prefer to see 12 inch wheels as the standard for anything that hits 25 plus miles an hour. Increased stability at high speed and improved bump and obstacle handling are just two major benefits that could be had from increasing wheel size. 10 inch wheels for slower or entry level scooters is a fine standard, something I have personally tested as I have used the Highboy S2 Pro for my commute for quite some time. However, going below 10 inches in any scooter seems unnecessarily small. The tiny 10 and 8.5 inch wheel sizes offer no tangible benefits other than perhaps a small decrease in size and weight, but not enough to justify the drop off in ride comfort and safety. Number 4, Tire Type. I think choosing the correct type of tire to use for each electric scooter is something that doesn't get enough thought from the manufacturer of these scooters, so I wanted to suggest improvements in that area too. First off, scooters come in a very wide range of speeds, size, and intended uses, but generally speaking, one of the biggest upsides of using an electric scooter over any other form of transportation is the convenience. Scooters are, in my mind, at their best and fulfilling their intended role when they are low maintenance and convenient to use. The choice of tire on an electric scooter should reflect that goal, so solid and honeycomb tires on low to mid-range electric scooter and foam core or tubeless pneumatic tires on higher end scooters, in my opinion, should be the standard. Tube pneumatic tires should not be anywhere near electric scooters as they directly conflict with the goal of an electric scooter to be simple, convenient, and easy to maintain. Fixing a flat on an electric scooter, especially fixing flats on a regular basis, is tedious, utterly frustrating, and in some cases impossible. And here are my examples of that. Changing a flat tire on the Mantis or Eagle One starts with removing these bolts and taking the brake caliper fully off in order to give the throttle line some slack. You have to fully pull the hub out, in the case of the Eagle One, remove the brake rotor, and remove the hub bolts that split the tire, pull off the old tire, install the new tube in the exact right position, making sure the tube stem is bent at the right angle, and then reverse the whole process to reinstall the wheel. This typically takes me 30 to 45 minutes to do correctly. 
At one point, I was doing this once a week because of how often I was getting flats. This also means I was regularly buying patch kits, or in many cases, new inner tubes, which were marked up at ridiculous prices, almost bordering on thievery. Another example, my very first scooter ever, the Hover 1 Alpha, got a flat and to this day I still cannot get the tire off of the hub. There are no bolts that will split the hub apart and the tire is installed so tightly that even two people with tire levers could not get this tire off. I have no idea what size tube I would need to get or if the size is even available. The choice to go with pneumatic tires on the Alpha means that now the scooter forever has a flat tire and is unusable. The Highboy S2 Pro, a scooter I really like and recommend, has gone the correct route by coming out of the box with solid honeycomb tires. Not once have I ever woken up, checked a tire, and found that it was flat. This peace of mind is amazing. In that same vein, as I have mentioned in previous videos, the foam core tire that I am using with my faster scooters is amazing and I can't believe I didn't go foam core sooner. As I mentioned, I also think tubeless pneumatic is a great option if you want the comfort of a pneumatic tire but more durability and long term protection against flats. I have seen some companies dabbling in this, specifically on the eMove Cruiser. I haven't personally been able to test their claim that they've only seen a 0.003% flat tire rate in their tubeless pneumatic tires, but I like the idea of them and I know that tubeless pneumatic tires offer greatly increased puncture protection. I hope that more companies will hear feedback and look to ship more scooters with solid or tubeless pneumatic tires. Number 3. Improved Frame Geometry When two-wheeled transportation starts looking for ways to innovate, it seems that geometry is one of those places where huge improvements can be seen. If you look at the latest trail mountain bike frames and compare those to even just a few years ago, you'll find that huge steps have been made towards improving the overall shape and angles of the frame. This is the kind of progress and focus I would love to see from the scooter industry. Experimenting with platform height, handlebar height, frame thickness, and metal choice are all design aspects that would work towards optimal scooter design and the best scooter for us, the consumers. For this video, I'm more focused on one particular aspect of frame design, and that is the angle of the steering tube relative to the ground, also known as head angle, caster angle, rake, or steering axis angle. I've briefly touched on this subject in previous videos, but I would like to cover it more in depth here and explain why making changes to this can drastically improve ride performance of electric scooters. For the sake of consistency, I will refer to this angle as head angle from now on. A steering tube that comes directly up vertically from the wheel at a 90 degree angle would have a very steep head angle. An angle this steep typically leads to instability at high speeds, including speed wobble. It also makes going over bumps and hitting debris a treacherous affair. Current electric scooters have surprisingly steep head angles and some are nearly vertical. A slacker or less steep head angle leads to a more stable ride and better control at high speeds and over bumps and debris. This is another thing that the Highboy S2 gets right, and I would love to see more of this geometry in faster scooters where it could really make a difference. Combining this with larger wheel size, as I mentioned before, could create a double team effort that would make scooters more stable and smooth and more capable of taking on poor terrain. Number 2. Waterproofing I believe that the distinct lack of fully waterproof scooters is one of the biggest things holding back electric scooters from becoming a reliable, everyday form of transportation. This change is so glaringly obvious that it is clearly a choice on the manufacturer's part to cut a corner to save money. Advertising something as a form of everyday transportation, then not making it so you could even drive through a puddle is unthinkable. With it snowing as often as it does here, I'm reluctant to use my scooters at all, even on snow plowed roads, as I fear any sort of water or melting snow will damage my scooters. It really shouldn't be this way, especially with scooters as expensive as the Mantis or the Eagle One. I'm not sure what else to say about this. Manufacturers need to make scooters fully waterproof and rideable in the rain. It should have been this way from the beginning and should be standard now. Please get your act together. Number 1. Full Customizability and Upgradeability So many scooters come equipped with fixed handlebars or unchangeable brake components or a number of unchangeable things. My S2 Pro is a great scooter but comes with handlebars that are more narrow than my liking. There's no way to change out the handlebars or make any significant adjustments to the throttle or electronic brake. On my Cabo Mantis, the brake rotor sits on the side of the hub where the throttle wire runs, making the rotor impossible to change without fully disconnecting the wire from the inside of the battery compartment. 
Additionally, the handlebar clamp on my Mantis only fits 22.2mm handlebars, a very uncommon size for modern handlebars. Having full control over the customization and upgrades on your scooter should be more accessible on all models of scooter, so I'd like to see companies taking measures to give this ability to the customer. This means including things like a standard size 31.8mm handlebar clamp to allow for handlebar upgrades, as well as full accessibility to all brake components. Using these things means that all bike components sold can also be used for scooters. Scooter-specific upgrade parts could follow, but for now I'd really like to see companies making an effort to allow riders to customize those things on the rides that they wish to. And those are my top 5 changes I want to see scooter companies and manufacturers making in the near future. I already see some smaller companies, especially companies using Kickstarter to fund their scooters, implementing some of the things that I mentioned. So I think the industry is headed in the right direction. I actually plan on looking at some of those Kickstarter and Indiegogo scooters in a future video and looking at what I like about them and what design changes they are making that other scooters could adopt. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and drop a comment about changes you would like to see to scooters in the future. Subscribe for more scooter and PEV content and I'll see you in the next video.